Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Here are the words again of the prophet Jeremiah, the word of the Lord to Jeremiah. The wise men shall be put to shame. They shall be frightened and taken by force. Behold, they have rejected the word of the Lord. So what wisdom is in them? God had warned and warned and warned some more the people of Israel and Judah through his prophets about their unfaithfulness, their idolatry, their willingness to openly worship the false and pagan gods of the neighboring nations surrounding them. Israel was even sacrificing children at times and participating in vile rituals involving various forms of sexual immorality. By the time Jeremiah preached these words from God, Babylon was right around the corner. Babylon the Great. The buzzing bee of Babylon that was far off, but certainly on the horizon at the time of Isaiah, now 200 years after Isaiah, was just where God promised they would be, ready to shame and frighten and dismay and shatter the confidence of Israel and take them away by force off to a place where they did not want to go. God would end his gracious visitation and presence among them in the temple at Jerusalem. Ezekiel would see the glory of the Lord leave the temple. Jeremiah would see the Babylonians tear Solomon's temple down and Jerusalem with it, and the prophet would weep and lament, and the people would lament in exile too. They cried out, by the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows there we hung up our lyres. For there our captors required of us songs, and our tormentors mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? The exile to Babylon was sad indeed. The Babylonians destroyed not just buildings and walls, but even children and babies lives shattered and ruined. The rest they took into exile, and there they goaded their captives into singing psalms meant for worship at a temple which no longer existed while they were sitting far away by the great rivers of Babylon. Why did this happen? They did not know, as Jesus says, the time of their visitation. They did not know that it was the time of their overseeing by God through the preaching of his prophets. This was not just that they did not follow the commands of God, that they participated in idolatry and continually made themselves unholy before the living God. No, those are just merely the symptoms. They have rejected the word of the Lord. They do not believe. They do not have faith in the word and promises of God. They did not trust God for all things, up to and including the Messiah who would free them from slavery to sin, death, and the power of the devil. Their unbelief in the gospel promise of God showed itself then in symptoms of severe idolatry and adultery. The symptoms were bad enough. The unbelief is damning. They have rejected the word of the Lord. So the people were sent into exile in Babylon and they were guilty of not just rejecting the preaching of God's word, but they also therefore rejected the eternal word, 
the living word come down from heaven, the eternal son who would one day be made flesh for them to redeem them from sin. They had no faith in the saving and eternal life-giving promises of God to crush the head of the serpent. Their concern was with their belly, their pocketbook, their own lusts and whims and terrible desires. Everything else but the true God was their idol. That man who came to crush the serpent's head rode into the rebuilt holy city some 500 years after the Babylonian destruction on that lowly colt, the foal of a donkey, and that's the gospel lesson you hear today. The circumstances were a bit different, but the problems remained the same. God's glory, his only begotten son, was present in the midst of his people, living with them in their flesh, bringing on his eternal kingdom right before their eyes. The preaching of the gospel was in their ears, and they could hear and see God himself preaching it. But they did not know the time of their visitation. They did not know their eternal shepherd and bishop of their souls, who was there to fulfill all of God's promises for them. The leading men of the people, the Sanhedrin, the chief priests, the Pharisees, they too had rejected the word of the Lord, just as their descendants had, ascendants had. For years, they had misled and preached false doctrine to the people. Their problem was not necessarily delving into rampant pagan idolatry like 500 years before. Rather, to avoid such pagan worship, to avoid another potential exile from God, to get rid of the Romans, and to incur God's favor based on their own good works of piety and keeping the law, the leaders of Israel taught the people to rely on their own works, as Paul says, the righteousness of the law, to rely on their own efforts to perfectly follow God's law to please him. So to ensure compliance with the law, Israel's leaders had added layer upon layer of additional rules and regulations to follow. And yet, this is just as bad as going off to worship like the pagans. Faith in the gracious promises of God, faith in the gospel was not in existence, but for a faithful few. God's word was forgotten and not believed in favor of centuries of traditions and teachings of rabbis, great and small, all sinful and fallible, and ignoring God's holy word. So the leaders of Israel rejected Jesus. They had rejected God's word. They have rejected the word of the Lord again. They even say it's better for Jesus to die than for the nation to die at the hand of the Romans. Yet they were oblivious to their own spiritual and eternal well-being. This reliance on the law leads to idolatry. Faith in the self that says the self can do no wrong even done in the name of piety, all manner of sin then becomes permissible, like stealing from the worshipers at the temple, like falsely accusing and torturing and even crucifying God's son. God rejected all this as surely as he rejected the paganism of Israel 500 years before. Jerusalem suffered the fate that Jesus predicted, this time at the hands of the Romans, in a bloody and a fiery slaughter, not one stone was left upon another. The proud and self-centered Jews, though they were children of Abraham, because of their unbelief, they were broken off as dry branches from the noble olive of God's people. They have rejected the word of the Lord. But the word of the Lord had not rejected them. 
After Jesus had come into the temple, he began to throw out the money changers, saying to them, It has been written, My house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. And Jesus was continually teaching daily in the temple. But the chief priests and the scribes were continually seeking to destroy him, and so were the foremost men of the people. And yet they were not finding the opportunity where they might do so, because all the people continually hung upon the receiving of his words for their own benefit. Jesus once asked, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Will there be persistent prayer and faith towards God and his promises? Will men not rely on their own attempts to justify themselves before God and others? Or will, and will they beat on their breast and admit before God and men that they are poor, miserable sinners, contrite over their sin, that they will look in faith towards God for his grace and forgiveness, and that they will give up on their life of sin. Will they? Will the Lord find faith? And we know that we all participate in this. Our sinful flesh rejects the word of the Lord. It has no tolerance for God's word. Every day your sinful flesh will choose the path of idolatrous Israel instead of gladly doing God's will. You too will attempt to justify yourself before God and before the neighbor and up against the neighbor. You will fall for the temptation of holding your own works up to God. These are symptoms of our inherent tendency towards unbelief inherited from our first parents. Despite the continuing hatred and intolerance and unbelief of the chief priests and the scribes and the foremost men of Israel, Jesus fought that darkness during that holy week before his death and he continued to come and teach and preach in this cleansed house of prayer his gospel news. And the faithful hung on his every word. They were faithful there. And there were faithful there. Because faith comes by hearing the word of Christ. God's word does not return unto him empty. No matter how hard the sinful flesh fights to reject. And some will fight hard enough. But God does not return empty handed. The good shepherd returns with the lost upon his shoulders, rejoicing. God has not rejected you. God loves you, his creation. Now is the time of his gracious visitation for you. God the Father has sent his only son to come and sweep out the temple, to make clean his house of living stones, God's Son came to seek and to save you in your lost condition, to cleanse you of sin, to save you and the whole world, not waiting for you or the world to come to him, because no one can or will. But Jesus first came to you, came into the world, became man, served you, died for you, rose again from the dead, and sends you his Holy Spirit and gives you that word of promise. And he opens heaven so wide that all men might enter. Besides, he gives you his rich promises and assurances that he will care for you in time and in eternity, here and there, and pours out into your hearts all the fullness of his grace. On account of the cleansing blood of Jesus, you are saved from the sin of unbelief, from the sin of rejecting the word of the Lord. The Lord's saving crimson flood washes you clean in the waters of your baptism. Jesus preaches to you his gospel of peace in your ear, feeds and strengthens you with his forgiveness in his body and blood. Jesus cleanses you, his living house of redeemed flesh, and he continually preaches to you his salvation, his forgiveness, so that you might continually hang on his every saving word.
and learn from him not to live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from his almighty and eternal mouth. That living voice of Jesus, his powerful and creative word is a blessing like rain from heaven. Thankfully, it's more consistent than the rain that comes to here. God showers it down on you out of his grace and his love for you, that you might hear his gospel news and believe in him as your Lord and your Savior, and so be saved. That you might daily live in your baptism, lives of repentance and faith, his love flowing down to you and through you to the neighbor who needs it. You know, that's a lot of freight that's put on preaching. God sends his gospel preachers to you to serve you with his saving word. And men are drawn unto the crucified and resurrected Lord Jesus. We pray that our Heavenly Father never take the reign of his gospel away from us and that we never reject his word but always hold fast to it, believe it, and reflect the light of his love to the neighbor and to the world who so dearly need it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs>